What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. I'm getting back to one of my regular monthly videos that I skipped last month. That is my Q&A series, Probing Paul. This is episode number 72. Today I'll be answering your questions, including a very popular one right now. Should you upgrade now or wait for the stuff that's launching towards the end of the year? I'll be doing a little bit of mail time. I have a few packages that have arrived, so I'll be opening those. I'll be sharing the secret to picking the freshest and most ripe avocados without them being too ripe. And I have a big announcement that I'm finally ready to tease you guys with, but not till the end of the video. Excellent! Today's video was brought to you by the Corsair K70 RGB Pro Mechanical Gaming Keyboard, powered by Axon Processing Technology and Genuine Cherry MX Mechanical Switches. This board packs its aluminum frame with features like dynamic per-key RGB lighting, a detachable USB Type-C cable, durable PBT double-shot keycaps, and IQ software support on both PC and Mac OS. You also get dedicated media keys, a multi-function volume roller, onboard storage for up to 50 profiles and more. So for further details on the Corsair K70 RGB Pro, click the sponsor link in the video description. Before we get into the questions today, a quick reminder that all the questions I'm answering, or most of them, were picked from the comment section of last month's Probing Paul, which is episode 71, and there is a Probing Paul playlist if you guys are interested in times I've been probed in the past. And there are timestamps if you want to jump to a specific question, or to mail time, or to that uh, special announcement that I already alluded to. The first question though is from Jeff Murray. Hey Paul, I used your videos to build my 2700X V450 Tomahawk RTX 2070 Zotac PC in December 2019 got him through the pandemic and he's wondering if it's time to upgrade. Looking at maybe a 5800X, X570, RTX 3080, or a 6900 XT, or should he just wait for the stuff that's launching in the next few months? We got the new AM5 platform from AMD. We have new 40 series GPUs uh, from Nvidia. We have Raptor Lake or 13th gen core CPUs from Intel coming. And from AMD Radeon, we also will supposedly have RTX 7000 series cards launching before the end of the year too. But thank you for the question, Jeff, and I will have a refreshing malted beverage uh, later in the day today. It's a little bit early for me to get started on that right now. Now I'm gonna do my best to answer this question in a somewhat general way so that it applies to any of you guys out there who might be also asking yourselves the same question, but it is also somewhat subjective. So for example, Jeff has provided me with some good information here, which is the system that he's currently running. A 2700X B450 motherboard and RTX 2070. Even though that's about three years old now, that is still a very solid setup for gaming. And I would say that if you're gaming at say 1440p, maybe even up to 144 hertz or so, you're probably still just fine with the rig that you're currently running. And it's probably gonna be worth your while, Jeff, to hold off on an upgrade, at least until the next generation of stuff starts to launch. And if you'd like to know when this stuff is launching, the AM5 platform is currently promised for fall 2022. And fall could mean anywhere from September 23rd to December 21st, 2022. I feel like December is probably pretty late. Chances are AMD is gonna try to get in on the end of the year sales leading up to Black Friday and everything. So I would say probably earlier in fall than later in fall, but we're likely looking at September or October. AM5 is an exciting platform for AMD because it's their first major platform upgrade in quite a few years. They've been on AM4 for quite some time and we're hoping AM5 is gonna have the same amount of longevity. So hopefully people who get in early will have upgrade paths for years to come as many early adopters of the original Ryzen series found that they still had access to. Like 300 series motherboards for the Ryzen 1000 series processors were eventually upgraded to be able to slot in Ryzen 5000 series CPUs, which were way more advanced. On the Intel side, we have Raptor Lake, AKA 13th Gen Core, which is supposed to come out towards the end of the year. We haven't heard too much in terms of a specific launch date, but we are starting to hear some early rumors and leaked benchmarks for 13th series processors starting to trickle out in some of the benchmark data databases that are available online. But if recent Intel launches are any indication, I wouldn't be surprised if the Raptor Lake launch is somewhat limited coming around the November timeframe with more stuff planned for the beginning of the year in 2023. Kind of a similar situation with AMD Radeon graphics cards. We have been promised the 7000 series before the end of the year, but leaks and such around that have been pretty limited so far. So kind of like my expectations for Raptor Lake, I feel like the 7000 series is gonna have a limited launch towards the end of the year and not make as much of an impact until 2023. For Nvidia though, the RTX 40 series does seem to be steaming ahead. And it seems like we're looking at probably October, November and December launches for cards like the RTX 4090, 4080, and 4070. So with all that in mind, the new platform and new CPUs, more new CPUs, more GPUs, and more new GPUs, should you upgrade now or should you hold off? 
I would say, and yes, I did give similar advice to this back in 2019 that I somewhat regretted, but I would say you should hold off and wait until these launches get a little bit closer because for one, you'll likely see some discounts on the current Jet hardware before it all sells out of the major retailers. So you might be able to get a better deal on upgrading on your current platform when that new stuff is right on the threshold of coming out because that's when sales of the last gen stuff starts to really dip. And sometimes they put it on fire sale so they can clear out inventory and make room for the new stuff that's coming in. But another reason I pulled up your question specifically, Jeff, as a representation of should I upgrade now or should I wait, is I feel like you're at a pretty good cutoff point with the 2700X, a B450 Tomahawk, and a 2070. I think you're in a pretty good situation right now to hold off. Whereas if you're running older hardware, something pre-Ryzen or something earlier, than 2018 or so on the Intel side, then I would say maybe, yeah, keep an eye out for good deals right now and upgrade sooner rather than later just because you're gonna see a big bump from the current gen stuff that's available right now to say nothing of the stuff that might be out in a few months time. The next question though is from Mark Doughty. Uh, he recently upgraded to a 5800X. Under heavy load, temperatures reached the mid 80s. I'm assuming you mean Celsius. Within spec, but still a little concerning. And he's got an NZXT Kraken X41, which is 140 millimeter meter all-in-one liquid cooler. He's asking if it's time to upgrade. Your 5800X, no, you're just fine with that for right now. But keeping an eye on your CPU temperatures is something that you should do, whether you've just built a system or whether you've been running it over time to see if something might be going wrong or your fans might be getting clogged up or something like that and your temperatures are going up. Here are my temperature numbers from my 5800X 3D review. So this is a 5800X 3D on top, and this is a 5800X, which is running a slight overclock with PBO2 enabled. My temperatures are in the same ballpark as you're talking about. You said mid 80s, I'm peaking at around 81 and averaging just below that 78.7 was my result. This is with a 15 minute Ida 64 stress test. And I was testing with what should be a better cooler than you're running because it was a 360 millimeter radiator AIO, uh, the Corsair H150i Elite LCD. To answer your question more specifically, I wanna ask, what are you doing? What is your heavy load? What is the specific workload you're running on your 5800X that's getting the temperatures up to the mid 80s? If you're just gaming, then yes, I would say you either need to upgrade your cooler or check the installation to see if it's installed properly and you have good pressure between the AIO block and the CPU heat spreader. If your temperatures are more reasonable while gaming, but they're just getting up to being this hot when you're running a specific workload, something like the Ida 64 stress test, or if you're re-encoding video or something like that, that can put a pretty heavy load on the CPU. In that case, my question would be, how long are you running these workloads for? If it's a short-term basis, like 10 or 20 minutes, if you're just encoding a video real quick and you just do that every few days, that's kind of like what I do then I'd say you're probably okay with the existing cooler that you have. But if you're running a workload that takes a long time and you're hitting these temperatures for an extended period, like a half an hour, an hour or longer, then you're actually going to thermally saturate your all-in-one liquid cooler. Your liquid temperature is probably gonna get above 60 degrees Celsius. And I think you should be able to monitor your liquid temperature with the NZXT cam software if you have your AIO plugged into the USB connector on your motherboard. But generally speaking, with all-in-one liquid coolers, you do not wanna have that liquid temperature go above 60 degrees Celsius for any extended period of time. That can severely shorten the lifespan of your all-in-one cooler and it can eventually lead to pump failure. So hopefully all that information helps you drill down your problem a little bit more. I'd say depending on your more specific scenario, you might be just fine with the cooler that you're currently running or you might wanna upgrade ASAP if you're actually getting your CPU to 80 to 85 degrees Celsius for an extended period of time on a regular basis. Next question here from R. Grecon, and this is a bit of a longer one, but there's actually a couple parts to it. The first one I wanna address is he says he's slowly gathering parts for the next system. And this is one thing I wanna address. I've talked about it before, but if you are getting parts together for a gaming PC, one thing I typically recommend is to at least get the core components that you can assemble together with like an outside of the box build at the same time. If you're getting individual pieces like a motherboard and then you're waiting a month or two to get like your CPU or your memory, for example, you might miss a defective part. You can't really test the motherboard unless you have a CPU and memory at least to slot into it. 
and a power supply to connect up so you can power it on and at least see if it accesses the UEFI or the BIOS. But most PC hardware is gonna come with a 30 day return policy from the retailer that you purchase it for if you're buying from someplace like Amazon or Newegg and you will want to return that part for a replacement or a refund within that time period because it's much easier to work with a retailer to do a return than it is to do a return through the manufacturer. So just a general point of advice that I try to make people aware of is that you probably should not be buying your PC parts one at a time spaced out over the course of many months. You should save up your money and then buy at least those core components at the same time so you can at the very least plug them in and make sure they're functional and you don't need to return anything right off the bat. Second part of the question is that the cooler that he got to go along with his open air ATX case and 850 watt power supply and SSD actually came with damaged and missing pieces. So Arctic support might be offering him a replacement, but he's wondering about a downdraft cooler. And here's a specific thing here. I don't plan on overclocking or doing top tier hardware. Uh, I will probably wait another generation or two, but thinking about something like a B660, 12400 and 3070. So if you're considering CPU cooling and you're not planning to overclock, and you're not planning to get one of the highest tier chips that has the maximum amount of cores and threads available on the current platform, then you can get away with a much less powerful cooler. Consider, for example, that the 12400 ships with a very dinky stock Intel cooler that gets you by just fine for day-to-day -day use. That said, upgrading your cooler can get you a bit quieter performance and it can help the CPU to run a bit cooler over time. And yes, a downdraft cooler or one with a fan on top that pushes air down over the motherboard versus a tower style cooler that just pushes air sideways this way is going to provide much more airflow over the power delivery. And that can also aid with your motherboard's longevity and not having your power delivery components running too warm at the same time. So while tower style coolers are often most effective for getting the lowest temperatures on your CPU specifically, considering the other components around your CPU is a good thing to do and a downdraft cooler for your use case where you're not planning to overclock your CPU and you're running something a little bit more modest like a 12400 definitely is a good way to go. Just a couple more questions. This one's from Peter Bernhardt, who says, I love your content. Thank you, Peter. I have a question. Is a five-year-old unopened tube of NTH1 thermal paste still okay to use? This is Noctua thermal paste, and let's see what Noctua says. One thing I do like about Noctua is that they have a lot of industrial customers, and they're very good about providing a bunch of really good product information about the products that they sell that's on their website. And they even have shelf life listed, which I appreciate. You don't even have to dig down into some sub specifications menu or something uh, can be stored at room temperature for at least three years uh, and if you actually install it then you can use it on the CPU for five years or more. So your answer is no. You should not be using your five-year-old unopened tube of thermal paste because Noctua says shelf life's only three years and you've gone a bit beyond that. Now, is it possible that your thermal paste is still just fine and you could still just use it? Yeah, probably, but given that you're talking about thermal paste, which typically costs around 10 bucks for a tube, I'd say just get some new thermal paste and go with that. A funny story, today the YouTube comment section just broke for quite a while actually. I think it was down for an hour or two and it it was right at the time when I was trying to dig into the comments from last month's video and get questions to answer you guys. So we got a couple here at the end that are actually from Twitter and these are responses to a tweet that I made just a few days ago and it's right here. Look at these avocados that I got. These are from the special bin that they had right at the entrance to the store where they had all these slightly mushy avocados that are probably a little bit too ripe so they're selling at a little bit of a discount. I went and selected these very carefully. This is actually five of the six that I chose. And as you can hopefully see, apart from, you know, maybe one or two very, very small spots, these avocados are just, they're all perfect. They're all ideally ripe, but not unripe. And for anyone who's wondering, I had all these avocados to make some guacamole to go along with the carnitas that I made for uh, our good friend, Steve, who recently had a baby. And uh, since they have a newborn baby and stuff, we brought them some food so they could eat food which uh, some of our friends and family did for our family when we had Hannah when she was first born. And we were very grateful for that. It's, it's really helpful uh, to have some fresh made food when you've got a new baby. But the question that many people had is, what's the secret? How did I, how did I go about picking these avocados in the way that I did? And I actually did reply on Twitter, but I thought I'd give you guys a quick demonstration right now. For an avocado to get overripe, uh, air needs to get inside. And there's one main point where the air gets in, and that's right here at the top where the stem would have connected. So that is the first place that you just wanna push in on a little bit. If there's an air pocket there, if you can feel the skin dip in a little bit because there's air underneath, don't get that avocado because chances are it started to rot at least up there towards the top. 
Now it is possible for air to get into other places if you've got a ding or a dent or a scratch or something like that. So you should check the rest of the avocado for that sort of thing. And then beyond that, you just wanna give it the light squeeze test. If it's hard completely, then it means it's just unripe. You can buy unripe avocados, put them in a paper bag and leave them on the counter, and then they will ripen over time. I find that when I do that, I forget about them, and then when I go to get them, they've overripened and they're not good anymore. If you buy them perfectly ripe like these, which is just a little bit of give as you squeeze them, you can just feel a little bit, a little tiny bit of tenderness there. That means it's nice and ripe. And then you can take these and store them in the refrigerator, and then they'll stay nice and ripe like that for some time, like those that I cut were from a few days ago. This has been in the refrigerator since. And I was gonna open this one up for you guys, but um, this is actually for my wife and I don't want it to start to turn early or anything like that. So um, trust me, this one's also just as ripe as the others. One last one here, and this is more of an honorable mention than an actual question, but uh, L or Real Wet Yeti said uh, he saw some videos on wooden PCs and he used wood parts, a blowtorch, and some leather to do this build. And I just wanted to show it to you guys. Look, look how cool that looks. I love the leather backing there with the cross hatch pattern or whatever you would call that. It looks like he actually like burnt the wood to do the finish and stuff like that. And uh, I have a video on using motherboard standoffs, to, mounting motherboard standoffs to a wood piece in order to mount a motherboard to that. And I wanna do more woodworking slash PC building stuff. Hopefully I can do that very soon. And I also appreciate that this system is wall mounted up here too, keeps it nice and up off the floor. Um, there's a look at the finished build. So yeah, I'll post a link to this tweet in the video description if you guys wanna look at those pictures a little bit more closely. Excellent job on that build, real wet Yeti. But now it's time to open some stuff that's been sent to me. First off, I have a letter, and if you guys wanna send me anything, send it to my P.O. box, it's listed in the description. It's P.O. box 4325, Diamond Bar, California, 91765, in case you're interested. This one apparently came from Buffalo, New York, and I have no idea what's inside. <laughs> so this is a scolding or an admonishment for the video that I posted on May 22nd, which is a tech news, which uh, I got a little cheeky, I guess, in the intro of this video. To be perfectly honest, things were going a little bit not great for me during the month of May. You guys might know exactly why. And so I threw in some off-color language, which Jim uh, did not appreciate, and apparently I have lost a viewer as a result. Jim, you're not the only one who kind of let me know that the, the intro wasn't really appreciated. However, it was contrasted by a lot of people saying that they actually did like it. But I guess while I am sad to see Jim go, uh, I, I, I can point at this statistic from that day, uh, which is that there are a few people who joined as Jim was leaving. And I find that interesting because this was just before I had a pretty big gap where I didn't post any videos. And then the next one I posted here is a video about Hero. And look what happened with that one. But that's okay. I'm really glad I made that video and thanks to any of you guys who responded to it. Next I have this package which came from Hong Kong and I am somewhat, I, I think I already kind of know what's gonna be in here because usually if something's sent from Hong Kong, it's a manufacturer who can't get a hold of me otherwise and so like, I'm just gonna send my product to Paul's PO box. And I guess maybe they do that because it works. Well, but let's see. Look at that. Aha, they are USB chargers uh, by Ugreen, a 65 watt and a 100 watt fast charger. Uh, again, please note, I have not solicited these products. I did not ask for them. I'm not being paid to show them to you. They just sent them to me and it worked. So here they are, they, some free publicity. Okay, I've got one more package here and this one I do know what it is, but uh, technically I'm not supposed to be showing you guys yet. So all I'm gonna give really, really quick is just a tease, a bit of a tease, and you guys can know that this is a thing and it's even coming out very soon. The specific date is Friday the 17th, so you'll likely be seeing some other people posting videos at that time. As for me, I'm just gonna quickly show you the box. This is the Lian Li Unifan SLINF120. The INF in these stands for infinity, so these are the Unifan Infinity 120 millimeter variants. I've used the Unifans before, they're the Lian Li fans that just snap together for both the connectors for the uh, fan to spin and for the RGB controls. And these have been in the works for some time and they've uh, done some sort of last minute changes to them. They're looking really cool, so uh, hopefully I can figure out a good way to work these into a build or something soon and give you guys a better look. For now, just a tease, uh, the Lian Li Unifan SL INF F120 coming very soon, Friday. <laughs>
And guys, that is just about all the time I have for this video, but I have that one announcement that I teased you with at the beginning, and I wanna tell you guys what it is. I've been holding off and pushing this back, telling you because it's something that's still in the works and still has the slightest, slightest chance that it might not happen, but I'm getting an office. I'm getting some dedicated space that's not here at home or in my garage, and I'm going to be moving in there and showing you guys the space and giving you guys a sneak preview and doing setup and move-in stuff. So probably several videos on that coming very soon. I'm actually really excited about the space. It's very close to where I live here, so I can get back and forth pretty quickly. And it means I'm not gonna have to deal with super hot temperatures as the summer progresses, which it can be an issue out here in the garage. It also means I'm not gonna have to worry as much about gardeners coming by or the trains that go by from time to time. Or of course, my awesome daughter, Hannah, who I love very, very much, but whenever she's here at home, it makes it pretty challenging for me to shoot videos at the same time. So it seems to be a good time for that. And things kind of lined up and fell into place also, as soon as I decided to myself, I think I should look into getting an office, which was maybe a month and a half or so ago at this point. But that's all for this episode of Probing Paul. Thank you guys so much for asking your questions, watching my videos, sticking with me through the good times and the bad. Hit the thumbs up button on your way if you enjoyed this video. And don't forget to check out my store at paulshardware.net, where you can buy shirts and mugs and pint glasses and all manner of high quality merchandise to help get yourself some high quality merchandise. Thanks again for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not already for all of that cool office move-in stuff. And we'll see you all in the next video video.